Hi, before I start this video, let me say it's just a bit of fun. A flight of fancy, a discussion, nothing more. And I say this because there are many Toll fans who love This Was and that lineup and still hold it up as the band's finest moment. Others will say the band's best period was Stand Up and Benefit and on and on and on. Having seen most of the Toll lineups over the years, my opinion is that they were all great and all important chapters in the band's history. And that Mick Abrams is a great guitarist. The summer of 1968, it seemed that Jethro Tull were gigging every week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes three times a week, sometimes even more. The constant gigging was moulding the band into a formidable unit. Glenn Cornick on bass was up there with the very best players around. Remember, at this time in 1968, bass guitar was mostly given to the guys who had failed as guitarists. Clive Bunker on drums easily could follow all the different musical twists and turns Tull were coming up with. Mick Abrams was considered back then one of the best guitarists in the UK, while Ian Anderson was evolving, growing into a top-class frontman. Every time you saw Toll back then, they just got better and better and better. During those months, the band were also building up a formidable fan base. This was shown to be the case at the Sunbury Jazz and Blues Festival in August 1968, when hundreds and hundreds of Toll fans turned up and the band turned in a classic performance. So everything in the garden looked rosy. But was it? Having recorded their first album, it was announced that Mick Abrams was leaving the band. Now, over the years, we've had many explanations why Mick got sacked or quit. Ian has said that he showed Mick the stuff he was working on for the band's next album, Stand Up, and Mick wasn't happy with the musical direction the band were about to take. Another story is that Mick failed to turn up for a gig, citing illness, and then was spotted coming out of a local cinema with his girlfriend, while Mick himself said this. Listen, this is what happened. I got very fed up with Ian Anderson, who saw Tull as his band, and he wasn't prepared to let anyone else voice their opinion on what was going on. So I left. But what I told them at the time is that I'd stay until they'd found a replacement for me, because there was no way I wanted to leave them in the lurch. A short while later, I was called to a meeting at the office of Terry Ellis, the band's manager. You know what he said to me? Ian and the boys don't want you in the band anymore, so you've been fired. I just replied to Terry, how can you fire me when I quit three weeks ago? Get out of here. My feeling is that Ian had looked around at the musical landscape back then and realised that to stay as a primarily blues-based band was a musical cul-de-sac. The way forward was blues-based, but a heavier rock-based blues. Cream, Hendrix, Jeff Beck, that was the way to go. Now, mix that in with all the other influences, all the other music Ian was hearing at the time, folk, classical and world music, that was the way forward. Mick Abrams said at the time he wanted to stay rooted in Chicago blues, which is kind of interesting since almost immediately after Tull, he formed the band Bloodwind Pig. And if you listen to their first album, A Head Rings Out, it's a great album, it's a, but it's a heady mixture of blues, jazz, blues rock and some prog. I also think that Ian felt for Tull to get to the very top, he had to take full control of the band. It's said that Mick also didn't like to travel and Tull would have had to gig constantly around the world to get to the very, very top. Tony Iommi also says this about his time when he was with the band. The thing that he took most from the band was Ian's cast iron discipline. When it comes to rehearsals, it's 10 a.m. in and you work right the way through to 6 p.m. And that's when you finish. No exceptions. Now, would any of the material on those two Bloodwind Pig albums, those two original Bloodwind Pig albums, A Head Rings Out, and getting to this, have fitted in with the stand-up version of Tull? No. As good as those albums are, I can't see any of the material fitting in with Jethro Tull. Could Mick have played on stand-up? Yes. 
The feel and phrasing would have been very, very different, but he certainly was skilled enough. Take a listen to Love Story, Mick's last contribution to the band, a song very close in feel to the sound of the album Stand Up. Many, many years later, a friend played Mick a great solo on guitar. Mick said, wow, that's amazing. Friend, it's your solo, mate, from Love Story. So maybe Mick wasn't really ever going to be where Toll were going. 